Jordan Peterson has become hugely successful. Um, what do you make of the, the phenomena? Why do you think he's become so successful now? There is a drought of authenticity and courage. And Peterson has found that hunger and he's tapped into it. And I, I admire his ability to detect it and to speak to it plainly in a way that it resonates with. I did, we were on a panel together in Vancouver and I watched his talk and he described his own surprise at how effective his message had, had been. And he basically said that if he had outlined his message as the core of a business model, that it would have looked laughable to him and that he was as shocked as anybody that people were resonating with it. But when, when you live in a world that is as full of crap as the world we live in, where people are advertising bullshit to you from the moment you get up to the moment you go to sleep, and then somebody finally tells you some truth that you need to hear, it's a relief. It's a relief just to know that there's some channel that isn't compromised by nonsense. And uh, he, I don't think he's the only one speaking truthfully, but I think he is speaking from the heart and people know it. Peterson's someone who, from his lectures, takes evolution seriously. How does that overlap with your work and how does it map onto your work? Well, I would say Peterson is an exceptional psychologist in the sense that at the moment academic psychology is in a crisis where all of the results that people have treated as true because they had a statistical significance uh, are turning out to be difficult to replicate and therefore probably fiction. Peterson is not swept into that madness because he's chosen to stay in that quadrant in psychology where there's solid ground. So he is, I don't want to say totally unique, but somewhat unique in that landscape as... Can you explain what that means, that he's chosen to stay in solid ground? What's the, the psychometrics, you mean? Yes. Peterson has stuck with psychometrics where results are replicated and the, the model is sound. And so anyway, he's less affected, maybe unaffected by the replication crisis. He as a psychologist takes evolution seriously, as all psychologists should. He can't be a specialist in evolutionary biology, so he's in some danger of dabbling and not seeing the full richness of some of the stuff that he's interested in. But nonetheless, it is to his credit that he takes it seriously where most of psychology uh, dispenses with evolution entirely. I'm an evolutionary biologist who takes psychology seriously because I'm interested in human beings and so a lot of the things I'm interested in play out in psychological terms. I'm not a specialist in psychology, but I have to grapple with it in order to, to understand the things I'm interested in. And so in some ways there's a comparison. We are either side of a divide about which our home ground is and which other discipline we are engaged with. Because his, his map is really based on Jungian psychology. The idea of the shadow, the idea of integration of the shadow, uh, the idea of the reality of myth and the, the usefulness of myth and religion. Is that something that maps onto your evolutionary biology territory? So I've been playing with the idea of myth for a long time and my conclusion has been that things that are costly to us but that last must be paying their way in some evolutionarily positive fashion. So myth clearly passes this test. And when I heard Peterson talking about it, my thought was that we were aligned. As I listened more to him, I realized that there is an alignment to an extent. We both believe that those stories that have persisted over time have a deep value. But then there's also a disconnect where he imagines that these stories are inherently timeless and I'm aware of how many things that are long-lasting are now not functional in the modern circumstances because of the level of evolutionary novelty. So I, I hope to have that conversation with him at some point. So in the Jungian psychology, he talks about the shadow, he talks about kind of the, the Jungian idea that the roots of the shadow reach all the way down to hell, like they're, they're sort of 
I guess, uh, desire to, to dominate, to, like, does that map onto your, your model in some way? I would say Jungian psychology is a useful myth. And I, you know, I, I don't mean that to sound pejorative. I think it's not true in a narrow, literal sense, but many Jungians have made progress because there's something to it. What I see is that <clears throat> we are a very odd species. We, like every species, have a mission that's pretty uninteresting. That mission is to pass on our genetic spellings to the exclusion of alternative genetic spellings to the extent possible. We also have the most amazing toolkit in nature for doing that, a toolkit that is capable of having conscious thoughts and what's more, exchanging those conscious thoughts between individuals. We can set our values, we can say what would we like to accomplish and what we would like to accomplish is capable of being something other than gene spreading. So my feeling is once you recognize how dangerous and mind-numbing our evolutionary purpose is, you can't help but rebel against it. And if you rebel against it, then you have this marvelous machine that you can set to a more interesting, more noble, more meaningful purpose. And why wouldn't you? Who wants to be an agent for a mindless program for spreading particular spellings to the exclusion of others? That's not an interesting game at all. So my sense is we face one of the greatest puzzles that has ever been. Maybe it is the greatest puzzle that has ever been, which is can we reauthor our purpose? Now that we know how generic and dangerous our evolutionary purpose is, can we take the machinery that was built for that purpose, the marvelous machinery set to that terrible purpose, can we repurpose it to something worthy of us? It seems a lot of the reactivity of the mainstream media, and it was certainly the topic of the Cathy Newman interview, was around gender. And why do you think that is? And why, as an evolutionary biologist, someone who sort of studies, studies sex and gender in detail, why, why do you think that this has become the, the crux of so many of these conversations? Well, I, I see it as a, like a slow motion train wreck, completely unnecessary, but can't be stopped because everybody has a sense that they have a dog in this fight, and we all do, but people do not understand where their interests lie in this discussion, and so they are lashing out for lack of a better term, in an attempt to shut down that which they think threatens them. But their map of what is threatening to them and what actually serves their interests is almost random compared to the reality of breeding systems and what people actually want. And the irony is, inside of evolutionary biology, this is all pretty well understood. It's not By that this, complicated. What do you mean? Male, female, sexual dynamics, what they mean and uh, what different social systems are about. So this conversation, there's no debate inside of evolutionary biology about whether males and females are basically the same. We all know that males and females are not basically the same. There are many things about us that are the same, but there are also many things that are different, and those things that are different may be inherited genetically, they may be inherited culturally, but they all have meanings. It's not an open landscape in which you can just uh, design whatever you want. So what I see is wishful thinking everywhere and people imagining they are much more informed about sexual dynamics than they actually are. I guess what a lot of people fear when they hear evolutionary biologists talk about sex roles is that we're, they're trying to sort of reimpose roles that were cast off in the 1960s and 1970s? So this, this is an important misunderstanding. The roles that we have recently abandoned are almost unbelievably ancient. My favorite example involves looking at a flower that contains both male and female parts in the same structure. A flower that has both male and female parts has a difference of opinion within itself about how enthusiastic to be about sex with strangers. 
The male parts are gung-ho for it. The female parts, not so much. The female parts, in fact, at a structural level, are coy. They put the pollen grains through a test in which pollen tubes grow down through a long structure in order to reach the ova. So we can decide that we either do want to retain female coyness in some form or that we want to reject it. But what we can't do is decide that that was imposed by some sort of Puritan uh, viewpoint amongst uh, males in, you know, in recent times. It, it's not. It, it stretches back far enough into the past that we can find it across the animal kingdom and if we look into plants it's separately evolved but nonetheless the same pattern emerges there. So we should alter the dynamics of sexuality for modern times and we should do so with fairness in mind. I'm very much in favor of this. I'm married to a woman who views the world in masculine terms. I mean she lives in a way that makes sense in masculine terms. She goes to the Amazon, she you know, enjoys adventure of a certain kind. I'm all in favor of women doing things that are not traditionally female, but I'm not in favor of pretending that femininity was invented by men to keep women chaste or something like that. It wasn't invented by humans at all. Because this, I guess, is another part of the, the discussion because from a sort of postmodern viewpoint, even using the words masculine and feminine, by, they assume that those are culturally defined and then you get into a question, well, what do you mean by masculine? What do you mean by feminine? And you, you then sort of enter a language game and a loop um, where they sort of don't refer to anything. But what you're saying is they actually do refer to things you can study right down to, to flowers and to plants and to, to things that are not, that are not human. There's a, actually a very simple story that accompanies this truth, which is there are very few creatures in which gametes are the same size. There's an unstable equilibrium in which gametes are equal size. And what that means is that gametes in any creature that has two sexes will tend to have one sex with small mobile gametes and another sex with large sessile gametes. Once you have that dynamic, you have an asymmetry in the interest of the parents in investing in those gametes. Small mobile gametes are not worth investing heavily in, and large sessile gametes are worth being choosy over because the investment that they contain is greater. Now that has almost nothing to do with us at a direct level, but every time we have had creatures evolve in which there's an asymmetry of investment in offspring, you get other things evolving as a consequence, like choosiness. It is natural that a creature that has larger gametes should be choosy. It is natural that a creature that gets pregnant should be choosy. It is natural that a creature that has offspring with a long uh, childhood should be choosy. Now in human beings, we have a really interesting situation where men reproduce by two strategies. Men can love them and leave them, in which case they're not very choosy because why should they be at an evolutionary level? And men, more generally, invest in their offspring, in which case they have every reason to be as choosy as women do. So human beings are not some standard case from nature. They're a special case and an interesting one. But to imagine that females being more reluctant about sex was the idea of men who wanted to impose something on women is preposterous. It exists in birds, it exists in insects, it exists in trees. And when you're talking about sort of masculine and feminine going down so deep, what I, what I hear is sort of the potential for that even to map onto some of the ancient wisdom traditions. The idea of the, of the Tao as being the yin yang, going sort of right down in, into being, that, that you have this sort of masculine and feminine dynamic playing out. Do you think that, does that kind of analogy work? Absolutely. And in fact, there's a, an important evolutionary principle discovered by a biologist named Fisher. Fisher's sex ratio principle says that it is actually, although males can produce many more offspring in a lifetime than females can, on average, males and females produce the same number because for every male who produces an above average number of offspring, there's some male who produces a below average number of offspring. So the variance in males is high, the variance in, male, in females is lower, but the average is equally valuable. So sex ratios tend to be even at birth, 
because there's no evolutionary advantage to producing males or females. In fact, what you want to do is produce that which is in lower supply. This is a perfect yin-yang. They are not symmetrical and identical in that sense, but they are compatible symmetries that reflect uh, a balance between two forces. And the punchline to the joke is that we are not one or the other. Evolutionarily speaking, all your genes but a handful spend half their time in female form and half their time in male form, and so they aren't really about one of these two strategies winning out over the other because half the time they would be on the losing end. It seems that there's a, a, a confusion between is and ought that a lot of the time, and you saw this in the Jordan Peterson Kathy Newman interview, where Jordan Peterson was describing the way that things are, Kathy Newman was immediately taking it as that he was saying this is the way that things should be. You're, you're saying that I should, I should do this. Is this, is this part of the, the, the substructure of this conversation? The is art question is absolutely basic. You can't really have any of the important topical conversations that we need to have without covering this ground and realizing that to describe what is is not to imply anything about what ought to be or even what can be and maybe that's the third partner in that uh, in that triad when we look at evolution and biology we are looking at a completely amoral landscape there are many wonderful things in there there are horrifying things in there evolution is responsible for all of our best characteristics and our worst so at some level we should be having the conversation not about well you think this is what is therefore you're defending it as what ought we should be having the conversation about what that is do we want to retain what that is do we want to jettison and how much freedom do we have to move things and we have much more freedom than than those who are uh, pushing a naive symmetry uh, would imagine. We have a lot of freedom to refigure the dynamics of male and female and we should do it. Because th this I guess is the is the concern that when people talk about evolutionary biology as saying well this is our evolutionary toolkit, men and women have different evolutionary toolkits, what people then hear is a, a sense of this is unchangeable, this is we're, we're then in a binary between the conservatives view that we're kind of basically we're gonna have to go back to the 1950s and the liberal idea and how do we transcend that kind of that, that the, the culture war? Unfortunately there is a kind of failure of understanding that extends into evolutionary biology and also exists in a widespread form in public which has to do with evolution being synonymous with genes. So when people talk they will say is it biological or is it cultural? Well, that's not a good dichotomy. It happens that culture is equally biological as genes. And once we understand that, then we will realize that to say that some dynamic is evolved and that's why it exists in the present does not mean it's inflexible because if it's evolved, but it is transmitted culturally, we actually have an opportunity to, to alter that landscape. So if we look at, for example, female fighter pilots, there's no reason that females should not be fighter pilots if that's what they want to do. But warfare has always been the province of men. Does it need to re remain the province of men? That's a discussion we can have. But there's no technical reason, and obviously the fact that there are female fighter pilots tells us that we can retune that dynamic any way that we think is right. And lots of things in, in, this, in this area work that way, where they are evolved, there's a history, but it is transmitted in a way that it is amenable to being altered. I've often had a sense that basically what's needed is for the liberal worldview to be red-pilled in some degree. That to accept biology but then understand that it is in some degree malleable rather than being in sort of this reactivity to it. And this seems to be where we're getting stuck at the moment. I agree with you and you know I've, I've known for a long time as I studied evolution as a progressive that the left has an uneasy relationship with evolution. On the one hand it is the defender of Darwin against creationism traditionally. On the other hand when it gets to talking about evolution in human beings the left is extremely timid about what it may find and I think in some sense it is afraid of a boogeyman that just simply doesn't exist. 
evolutionary biologists as a rule tend to be quite left-wing. Dawkins in The Selfish Gene starts out, he says, if you, you, you should read this book as a warning, right, about how we ought to regard that landscape and the fact that we must alter things in order that it does not dominate our, our view of the world. And I think the trick is going to be to get people to listen long enough so that they understand that the conversation is not a power grab. Nobody's trying to take anything from them. We're trying to alert people to what that landscape looks like, what dangers it creates, and what alternatives we may have if we wish to pursue them. So I, 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 like, I like your argument that the left needs a red pilling. And I don't mean a right-wing red pilling. I mean a, an epiphany about what relationship it should have with, with evolution. It seems that there could be a resolution of saying, well, certain things are fixed, certain things are, are real. And so on the other side, you've pretty much got liberals often arguing against reality or just not facing reality. But there seems to be that there is the possibility of a deeper resolution of this conversation. Oh, absolutely. Um, both sides have a major blind spot. And were we to have one conversation, were we to have voices in it that understood the underlying dynamics, there is a resolution that I think you don't win everything, but everybody wins a large fraction of what it is that they actually want. There's a great deal that is true about our evolutionary nature, and there's a tremendous amount of freedom to change even many of those things that were handed to us evolutionarily. So I'm, I'm waiting for that conversation to happen, and we have to reduce the suspicion of each other and the polarization in order to have the discussion. <laughs>